will put on airplane mode. Is it silent? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 well, well, listen, I, <laughs> that's a call I got coming in here. <laughs> I think I had to leave and take it. <laughs> well, I don't know. How I, listen. Make sure you're current. Now, please. Now, please. Five minutes and go outside and take the call. So, we are. Good afternoon, all. We are reconvening the meeting of the Joint Select Committee on National Security. And this is our 19th meeting. I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Um, I want to welcome the listening audience and the viewing audience, and to remind all that this meeting is being broadcast live on the Parliament's Channel 11 and Radio 105.5 FM and the Parliament's YouTube channel, Paul View. This is a very auspicious hearing in that it's a public hearing and today before the committee is the Commissioner of Police and the representatives of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service Executive. I want to remind, and I don't have to, but I will just for the record, members and our guests that the questions will come through the chair and the answers will come through the chair. When you are speaking, you turn on your mic. When you are not speaking, please turn off your mic. Let me now welcome the newly minted Commissioner of Police, Mrs. Erla Hayward. Christopher, welcome. Thank you. I want to welcome Deputy Commissioner of Police, Kurt Simon, who was here on the last occasion. Welcome. The Chair. Assistant Commissioner of Police, Winston Mirage. Again, you were here on the last occasion, but welcome again. Thank you, sir. Assistant Commissioner of Police, Mr. Collis Hazel, who is now new to this session. Welcome, sir. Pleasure is mine. Welcome. And the Senior Superintendent Rishi Singh, Senior Superintendent Homicide. Welcome. Thank you kindly, sir. The team of the commission of, the, of this Joint Select Committee is Mrs. Jackie Samson Miguel, our secretary, Mr. Brand Caesar, assistant secretary, Ms. Crystal Gittins, graduate research assistant, Mr. Chad Salandi, graduate research assistant, Mr. Roger Hector, our legal officer. I will invite members of the Joint Select Committee to introduce themselves, starting, of course, with the vice chairman. Good afternoon, commissioner and team. Paul Richards, vice chair. Good afternoon. I am Randall Mitchell, member. Good afternoon, all. I'm Ayana Webster Roy, member. Good afternoon, Rudal Munilal, member. Good afternoon. I'm Jayanti Lachmidial, member. The purpose of this session is to present to the committee and to the public an evidential session with the Commissioner of Police to gain an understanding of the anti-crime strategies implemented by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to address criminal activity and crime in Trinidad and Tobago. We all know that crime is a phenomenon that affects us all, and it is something which we want to hear the Commissioner of Police on, and your team to tell us what are your plans, what are your strategies, and what you intend to do in the long term, in the medium term, and the short term as it relates to crime and criminal activity. I would now invite the Commissioner of Police to give us some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for your warm welcome and to members of the committee. First, let me start by Brief apology for my absence on the last hearing. It was by no means a disrespect. I did communicate. However, I 
appreciate the disappointment that was caused by my absence. So I am here today to, I hope, present myself well. This afternoon with me, based on the last hearing, I brought, in addition to the persons who were present, Assistant Commissioner Hazel, who was in fact the goal commander for Carnival 2023, to give us a synopsis of Carnival, and Senior Superintendent Rishi Singh, based on the questions you would have presented. Thank you. We are very happy to have you. Um, the, your reasons for non-attendance on the last occasion was accepted by us all, although we, we wanted to see you, but we have you here today, and we are very glad to have you here today. Let me start by asking you, Madam, there will never be a chance to have a second first, and you are the first, the first female appointed commissioner of police. Tell me, how does that, tell us, how does that feel? Honored, humbled, and very grateful, grateful to First of all, God for giving me this opportunity for appointing me, and might I say, anointing me to the position. I want to thank both members of the, the ruling party and the opposition for accepting my re the recommendation to have me. I yes, no, you go. So I want to assure the national public that it is my intention to bring about meaningful changes in policing of our country to ensure that we are properly able to manage the crime and criminal activities. Thank you. You've now been commissioner for what, three weeks, is it? Approximately three weeks? Yes. How has the job of commissioner, how has it been going? And tell us, what challenges have, are you facing in the performance of your duties as commissioner? I, Chair, I, right now I cannot, I will not identify challenges. What I would like to acknowledge is the support that I receive from my officers as we seek to advanced policing. With one question, and then I will ask member Lutch Medial to begin her line of questioning. Um, according to recent media publications, you described the spate of murders sometime before as the storm before the calm. Can you explain the statement to us, please? I would have used the term, the storm before the calm, because we, have, we are implementing new strategies to deal with the whole violent crime in the country. And as the strategies take effect, we will see a reduction. So that is why I would have referred to it as the storm before the calm, because we anticipate that our strategies will be fruitful. Member Lachmedial. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, Chairman, before I start the questions that I wanted to ask, and I would say that um, just to give the members here a little, um, a little preview, I am focusing on the issue of ballistics, as well as um, abuse of force. I have a question about that. But before that, I have one follow-up question, because, um, Madam Commissioner, you said that you expect the strategies to be fruitful. Now, last year, <clears throat> the country was sort of, I would say, traumatized, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, when I say the country was traumatized when we hit that 600 mark 
of Fermudas. For the first two months of this year, we've already hit the 100 mark. I think we're up to 105 now, perhaps. 102, 3, 4, 5, right. The point is that, um, and the question is, what is your timeline and what sort of timeline do you have in mind for these strategies to start producing results? Because at the rate we're going, um, if we continue along that trajectory, we could be looking at, you know, maybe a thousand before the end of the year. And I don't want to say, I, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that that's not the direction we're going. So give us a timeline. What is the short, medium, long-term projection that you have? <coughs> We will expect to see a change in the murder rate, short term by June, and long term by December. OK. So that by June or December, the committee could expect, perhaps, if we have you back here, to get an update and so on on how these strategies are producing yes. results. And would your strategies and I'm getting to the question now of ballistics. Will your strategies in tackling crime include as well the um, a raising of the detection rates? Yes, indeed. Presently, our detection rate is at under 13 percent. It is my intention, and with that of my executive, to focus more on the forensics, the use of DNA technology, and the ballistics. In this area, I, any further questions with regards to the ballistics, I would refer to Senior Superintendent Singh. Okay. On the last occasion, we did touch on that um, subject, and we were told that the use of um, CIRU and the training of officers is now speeding up the um, turnaround time for ballistics um, processing and so on. Now, most of the murders, I would say, in Trinidad and Tobago right now are linked to firearms. So certainly we have um, a need to do a lot of ballistics testing. Is there still a role to be played by the Forensic Sciences Center when it comes to ballistics testing in order to get a file prepared and taken to the DPP for instructions and to prefer charges, or at least to see a matter through at least the preliminary inquiry stage of a, of a trial? Chair, may I refer to Senior Superintendent Singh? Of course. Good afternoon again, Mr. Chair and all members. So if I understand the question well, it is you wonder whether the Forensic Science Center has a role to play in the ballistic testing. Yes, because you see on the last occasion. Getting the file over to the DPP. So they're waiting on the forensic to give a, an analysis so to forward the file to the DPP. I don't mean to have a, a long run up, but let, let me break it down for you this way. A murder happens, you go on the scene, you collect spent shells or you recover a firearm. You have to do certain things with those items in order to approach the DPP with evidence in order to get instructions to charge someone. Um, it may be required in order to further your, exam your investigations. And you would also then require certain things to be ready in order to see a matter through the court process, right, if you were to charge someone. Is there a role at any of those steps for what we used to know, I think they call them the tool mark examiners and so on, at Forensic Science Center, or is everything being done now in-house at CIRU? Right, thank you very much for that clarity. Mm -hmm. So let me just first then clear up a misconception. Mm -hmm. The role of the Forensic Science Center in the ballistic testing with the tool mark examiners, that remains the CIRU is really a place where the evidence collection converges. The submission to the Forensic Science Center stays. The ballistic testing actually occurs there with the machinery and personnel there. Um, what we have present at the FSC now that we did not have before was trained police crime scene officers who have had additional training in tool mark examination to supplement the staff in there to expedite the 
ballistic testing and matching. Okay. And thank you for that clarification, because from time to time, particularly when we're dealing with um, the issue of firearms, um, Ciru is being marketed, for want of a better word, as this new one-stop shop where you will have very quick turnaround time um, and matters are going to get before the court much quicker. But you would agree with me that the bottleneck at the Forensic Science Center and the need to have the certified toolmark examiner, who is a, um, a person and a, who holds a, a post in the public service, not the police officers you're speaking about don't hold that post, correct? Right? So the certified toolmark examiner who's listed in the legislation as a person who holds a civil service position in Trinidad and Tobago must still get involved in that process, not so? For the moment, yes. For the moment, okay. Do you have, well, you, forensics doesn't come under you. Um, do you know by chance how many toolmark examiners are at Forensic Science Center currently? This is just an estimate, but I think there are about four. Four. All right, so <clears throat> can you tell us then what is the average waiting time if you know that officers would, who let's say make submissions to Forensic Sciences Center, have to wait until they get back the report on firearms and ammunition from the toolmark examiner? I would say that waiting time is a time in flux at the moment. And I say that because we have a system where we are able to now make requests for particular matters to be expedited. And those matters that we really seek expediting on are primarily those that involve very serious crimes, murder being one of them, in addition to which, when we have persons in custody, of course, where we have the need to manage their stay in state before charging, we have a system where we can expedite those. So with the current relationship with the Forensic Science Center, along with the supplemental staff to assist, we can have ballistic evidence coming in in less than a week for those requests. For matters that fall to the conventional time, I just want to clear up that CIRU does remain a relative one-stop one -stop shop for the purpose of the lifting of fingerprints, and the um, swabbing of firearms to extract samples for potential DNA. And so it's a one-stop shop in that regard. And then it goes to the FSC for the use of the IBIS system to assist in the ballistic, in the ballistic testing. Um, you were going to say for the ones that aren't, where no request is made to prioritize. Yes. Um, could you give me an average time where there's no request for high profile matter or matter where a person is in custody? What's the average turnaround time for the reports from the FSC? My current observation, and this is not absolute, is roughly six months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you see, my information and experience is that we have matters currently before the court which are unable to begin and unable to um, see their way through at least the preliminary inquiry level because officers are saying that they are waiting on reports from Forensic Sciences Center sometimes for over a year, sometimes over 18 months. Um, and that is a very grave concern to persons and in terms of the confidence that people have in the justice system and the ability to deliver justice on time um, and to manage the flow of cases and secure convictions because it's creating a little bit of a delay. That's the reason I ask all these questions. So if you have any further information on that, uh, we'd be happy to receive it, if you could get any further information. As well as, if there are any plans that the TTPS is currently proposing, or that you may have, that could, that could fix some of these issues and make it a little more um, seamless and reduce that wait time and that bottleneck. Uh, you could provide it to the committee as well. I think it will be useful. And, and we can have that in, in, in writing. writing. Yes, Mem in Member Lashmidial, you have an, another question? I just have one other question I want to get to. With respect to when we put, put questions to the, um, to the organization, we were asking about the abuse um, and infringement of the use of force policy by officers. Could you just give us um, information on how many body cameras are currently owned and operated by the TTPS, 
what is the state of monitoring of those body cameras, and um, what are your plans for this year, 2023? I guess you all would operate by financial year as well, so for financial year 22 to 23, in terms of rolling out more body cameras and having real-time, perhaps, surveillance of police operations. Thank you. We have just over 1,100 body-worn cameras. They have been distributed throughout the 10 divisions for the, of the frontline officers. We are in Sorry, I just wanted, do you know off the top of your head how many persons you would categorize as frontline officers currently on active duty? Frontline officers would be almost a thousand. Can continue, madam, and you've distributed, you said home. you've distributed them over the 10 divisions. 10 divisions, uh, in um, 10 division, geographical divisions, plus the interagency task force and the garden emergency branch. Well, are you satisfied that those are sufficient for the needs of the police service at this time? No, that is not sufficient. We are in the process of procuring 400 more cameras. How soon will those be procured? That should be done within, within the next three months. Three months, thank you. One, one last question. You said that active duty, you consider about 1,000 officers and you have 1,100 cameras right now? Yes. So every officer on active duty ought to be wearing a body camera right now. Frontline, frontline front officers. Frontline officers ought yes. to be wearing a camera. There was an incident over the <clears throat> weekend, I think it was, of um, which made its way to social media. And there were a lot of, of course, questions arising out of that incident. It's a good somewhere in Princess Town. Um, the country right now, we get live updates via social media as to things happening, neighbors and so on, taking photographs, videos. Were any of those officers involved in that, what do they call a police-involved killing, wearing body cameras at the time? I am unable to say at this time. You are unable to say at this yes. time? You have ordered an investigation, however, into that matter? Yes, I have. Okay. Perhaps you could um, give us that in writing afterwards when you are able to confirm. Sure. Thank you. Um, Member Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, Christopher, congratulations on your appointment. We wish you all the best. A lot is riding on your shoulders with your team. Uh, I will uh, restrict my questioning in this round to two areas. One, the first of which is the issue of uh, mobile scanners, and, and uh, just to get some context. Uh, it was indicated by your immediate predecessor that the TTPS had been spending $1.8 million per month on two crime-fighting vehicles with scanners. Uh, this from former Acting Commissioner McDonald Jacob, uh, purchased on December 1st, 2019, uh, which in the former commissioner's words yielded no results. Can you give us some clarity on that? Is that accurate? And what has become of those, of that contract? I understand they were a contractual arrangement. Okay, thank you. The two mobile units were actually leased, not rented, not bought. Right. At present, we are investigating that whole contract. My information is that the units are not functioning 100%, and I have actually asked as, uh, my Deputy Commissioner, Simon, to look into it. So Mr. Simon will be able to give us some light on the situation. Please. Mr. Simon. Good day, to, good day Chair, good day to all. So as it relates to, the, to these two um, scanners, uh, they, they, they came into the service and they were, in fact, employed by our OCC, Operational Command Center. Um, there were eight persons trained in the TTPS to, to use these, um, th th this equipment. Uh, there was a transfer 
of the equipment and the personnel to traffic branch for, for better efficiency of the, of the use of the equipment. However, what happened in that these persons who were trained, they were certified for a two-year period. And that period has uh, already elapsed since some time in um, last year. And the certification is done by a Russian company. And so, so there are some issues surrounding the whole use of the equipment. Now, whilst these persons were transferred to tra traffic branch along with the equipment, uh, there were some technical issues appearing with the use of it, that generators and so on were not functioning properly. And, and so, so, the, so the units, we had to, to rest them to, to attempt to get them up and running and actually to, to look at the arrangement, the, the other contractual arrangements with that. And that is uh, something that I am looking into right now. Um, that contract, the, the investigation that I am doing with it, it's right now I say that it's at a, a sort of a sensitive stage and I don't want to, to say too much. It's an active investigation. Yes. So uh, would you be able to say how much that those two units from 2019 cost the TTPS? Um, it's 0.8 million for each. Each is 0.8 million. So that is $800,000 a year since that. So, and um, from 2019 to when? Well, that, and that, that is another part of the, the, the issue that is ongoing with, with that. Um, so, it, and up to 2022, you find that um, there wasn't any, we were unable to use the equipment. And we are now in communication with the, the contracting body and holding discussions about certain issues. So 1.8 so million a year per vehicle. Yeah, that is 1.6 1, 1. per year. And uh, for four years, has it, have, have the, with, with the challenges you've identified, have they yielded any results? My information thus far, and I, I would say this, it, is, it remains anecdotal. But my information thus far is that uh, we have not really realized any, any real evidential use of the, the equipment that would, would perhaps propel the police service into a, a better place in terms of detecting what the equipment is said to be able to detect. That's a wonderful way of saying it didn't work. Well, the, the investigation is ongoing. All right. Now, Fast forward to December 2022, December 22nd, 2022. And just b before I go, is there a timeline on that investigation? Yes, of course. And uh, in, in fact, there, there are preliminary reports, and I have sent out uh, instructions, more or less, for, for me to be furnished with additional reports uh, for the next, I, ex I expect a report in the next, within the next three weeks. So it's because of the, the layout and the different tiers that are, uh, you, you have to approach the investigation, you know, it's done in, in more or less by, by terms. Understood, it's, and it's yes. ongoing, so we don't want to comment too much. Fast forward to December 22nd, 2022. Uh, in your submission, dated uh, that date, the TTPS is in possession of mobile scanners that were purchased as part of the law enforcement apparatus. Uh, there are two currently being utilized by the Traffic and Highway Patrol branch. My first question is regarding, has the TTPS thought legal advice on scanning people without their knowledge or consent? I have not um, been able to unearth any such requests or any, or any such advice thus far, sir. Was that of concern to the TTPS in this regard? Because um, I saw a video, I can't vouch for the veracity of it, of the supposed scanners in use, and they were scanning a private car in the street. So I don't know if it's an accurate or it could be a concocted video, but have they been in use scanning people on the streets? So the, the two scanners that we had there, they were used. I am aware that they were used previously. They are not being used now. I, I don't want to comment too much on what, is, what appears on social media, as you are, you are aware that there were concerns used. with that. But they, we, they are not in use now. They have not been used for, for a while. Uh, and again, that is because of the personnel not, personnel not being certified and the, some other issues arising. So, yes. so the first set in 2019 were not in use because of issues arising with training and OSH issues. 
and this new set from December 22nd, 2022 are facing the same challenges in use or my misunderstanding? Well, I, I hear you mention um, training and, and us, us issues, and those, of course, you, you have raised that. I have, what I have stated is that um, the, the, the issue is one of certification of the officers, because the, the, the certification period has elapsed. And then to, to have officers recertified, that, that, of course, that is an, an issue. And also that now coins with our, with our concerns that we are investigating. And I just no, I'm talking about the new set now. There's no new set. Uh, just, so we just have one set? Yes, just the oh, same. My, my just misunderstanding. The same two okay, fine. Uh, so we have the cost. Uh, so those, so there are no current scanners in operation with the TTPS? No, we, we, are not, you, well, we are not using the two scanners that you are speaking about. Okay. Uh, of course, there is this, the ordinary hand scan. scanner. Okay, so. which is, all right, understood. Moving on now to the issue of the last new vehicles. Uh, in your written submission to the committee dated February 23rd, 2023, the TTP has provided the following statistics regarding the last new vehicles, which I understand is of great concern because as I, the, the, the statistics I'll present shows an upward trend. Uh, last new vehicles for the period 2017 to 2022, 2017, 1,095, 2018, 1,046, 2019, 892, 2020, 788, 2021, 612, uh, which was the lowest in the period and a big jump in 2022 to 1,511, totaling for that five-year period, 5,944. Uh, the total vehicles recovered for the period as presented in your report to the committee from 2017 to 2022. Of the 1,095 reported stolen, no, the last name, uh, 221 recovered, leaving 874 not recovered. 2018, of the 1,046, 191 recovered, leaving 855 unaccounted for. 2019, of the 892, 159, leaving 733, not accounted for. 2020, 788, uh, in 2020 recovered. 126, leaving 662. 2021, 600 reported, 122 recovered. And 2022, of the 1,511 reported, 491 re reported, which is an increase. Uh, leaving, making, uh, for 1,310 recovered, but 4,634 not recovered. This is a business model, but an illegal business model, but clearly someone is benefiting tremendously from the last new vehicles in Trinidad and Tobago. What is the TTBS doing about this, and what can you say to the public that this trend will be interrupted because this is quite startling and this, these are statistics that you presented to the committee. So, so and, I, and, I'm, and I'm glad that you, um, you have realized and even described it as a business model. And, uh, and that is how we are approaching it because we have seen it to be a business model. And uh, the, the, the figures are indeed staggering and they are of concern to us. In fact, we have a, a special project that has begun perhaps two to three weeks ago dealing with the Lassany motor vehicles. And I'm saying two to three weeks ago in terms of our exercises and operations, the, the project itself started before that because we were collating and uh, analyzing the data surrounding the Lassany, the incidents of Lassany motor, vehicle, motor vehicles. And um, I think that, that what we are doing now is uh, very promising. The potential of it is to actually shut down that, that whole business model of the Larceny Motor Vehicle Enterprise. And um, you know we are employing an, a number of tools, more particularly we have brought in our Financial Investigations Bureau into the set so that there's a, a combination then of, of investigators and agencies. We have even solicited uh, information from the, the SSA in going forward in this project. So we do intend to, to impact this business it, model. It doesn't seem like this could happen without, and this is my suggestion, you have no evidence to support this, some complicity at some level in licensing department. You can't get rid of 4,634 vehicles that were stolen. Either split them up to sell them in parts or resell them illegally 
without some kind of... So our investigations, I can I'm assure you, they, they, are, they are and would be far-reaching. Tell us, um, Madam Commissioner, one of your members, do, do you still have the stolen vehicle squad, or has that squad been disbanded? I know that there was a unit in the police service, a stolen vehicles unit. Is that still operational? Yes, sir, the stolen vehicle squad is still operational. And however, added to that, we are using our, our intelligence units and the divisional gang units. They have all been employed in, in dealing with this scourge. Because we, we, we see it as a serious uh, attack on uh, a front on, on, on our citizenry. But and do they work in tandem, or do, is, is one doing one thing and the other? Is, is there any synergy that, that, that would afford one side the knowledge that the other division has, or, or are they operating independently? Because it would seem that common sense will dictate that if they work together, they can pool their information and optimize results. Yes, Jay. And you, have, you would have heard me describe our approach as a, one of a project. And uh, because it's a project, the, we operate in unison with, with our different agencies. So yes, Jay, uh, it is a, a project being dealt with in a team effort to bring some sort of resolution to this issue. Just a, just a quick question, a, a frontal question. Is, uh, is your investigation, because you mentioned a while ago that it has far-reaching implications, is, is it that we are going to find that we still have the age-old issue in Trinidad Tobago of licensing persons involved in this issue? The, the investigation, in my mind, is it's promising. And uh, because it's ongoing, because of what I know about it, because of the intelligence that is, be, that is before, before me, I would not want to sit here and, and comment that far. But, so um, perhaps I, I, I want to just ask you if you can just uh, be, be patient with me and just accept it, it will be far-reaching. The 4,634 vehicle owners are not going to be patient. Mem Member Munila? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon again to our guests. Um, I have a few questions to ask and to follow up, to begin by following up on an area that um, Senator Richards raised. Um, Madam Commissioner, through you, maybe Mr. Simon has been answering these questions for us for the last, today and on the last occasion. Mr. Simon, I got the, uh, an impression, could I ask you? Is it the view of the Trinidad Tobago Police Service that these mobile scanners are useless? Uh, so, um, what I have noted thus far suggests to me that we have not been, been able to reap rewards that perhaps one would expect from such a costly event here. Mr. Simon, how long, you have said earlier, that those mobile scanners were at some time operational. How long were they operational for? I know that um, the, the, the records that suggest that since uh, 2019, 2020, 21, to some extent, yes, 22. Why I ask that is because mobile oh. scanners, to my knowledge, are being used in some parts of the world with good effect to detect vehicles on the road with uh, ammunitions, arms, and I'll get to those areas in a few minutes, uh, to detect, uh, you know, illicit materials and the words of the day, human trafficking, to detect that type of activity and so on, and has been used in the United States, Canada, Europe, in certain places and so on. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you asked the, you asked the features questions earlier, and now you are interrupting me. <laughs> Um, if yes. In your priest, there will be no need for uh, So, what I'm saying is really coming is we have heard two or three stories about the mo mobile scanners already. First, we were told that they were not operational. Then, we were told that they were operational. Then, we were told there were technical problems. Today, we are being told that there's a problem with the contract that we're investigating. It seems to me that this piece of equipment it is believed to be useless. And if it is useless, then maybe the option might be to retrieve whatever monies taxpayers have already spent on it. Or if it is not, to try to come to terms with the technical challenges, the human resource challenges, and get it in use. Because the, a critical problem here is, of course, we all admit, the use of 
uh, illegal firearms and ammunition in the commission of criminal uh, offenses. So I, I'm just putting that on the table because I'm not sure we could continually have this kicking the span down the road that the scanners are there because eventually they will be in a dilapidated state in which it will be like the point of pier refinery and we will get nothing from it. So I'm putting it on the table that way. I don't know if you want to comment on that before I go on to my substantive two issues. Um, I, I, I have heard your comments and of course uh, the end result of the investigation, if it should uh, perhaps pan out to what it is you are saying, I'm sure that we would take your recommendations even. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simon. I um, will not send them down point up here. Madam Commissioner, now, um, this matter, of course, a matter has been raised in the public domain and certainly on the last occasion. We, we all have the view uh, in the public domain and intuitively that uh, a crisis we face is the prevalence of illegal firearms and ammunition in the society that contributes in no small way to the commissioning of criminal offenses. Uh, within recent time, there has been a dreadful and, and frightful occurrence, again, from newspaper reports, because we will read newspapers, we don't have the information, as you may, um, of the discovery of ammunition, weapons, and so on, belonging to, or ought to belong in the custody of law enforcement. Now, it will include the police service, but I imagine other branches of law enforcement. And that seems to be uh, occurring with a monotonous frequency within recent times. And we are asking, I am asking to you, first, I'm sure it is a serious problem. Is there any new uh, policy, new structure, new initiatives on the part of the TTPS to deal with this type of occurrence, assuming that what we read and what we observe and the information given to us is indeed correct or, or may be accurate? Thank you very much. What is new? What is new? We have embarked on an audit of our, the distribution of our arms and ammunition at stations and units. So far, our reports indicate that all our ammunition are accounted for. What we have put in place with regards to controlling the ammunition, with regards to training, we have implemented where the armorer or someone from the armor, armor shop, the armory, will be present at the range to ensure that we monitor and control the use of the ammunition to ensure that all ammunition issued for training is accounted for. Um, Madam Commissioner, related to that now, a matter in the public domain uh, to which you have already responded, um, this matter related to the issues I'm raising now, not just the firearms or ammunition uh, belonging to protective agencies, but in the event where ammunition or uh, firearm weapons and so on are seized lawfully. Um, the custody of this, these materials, you will recall within recent time, you called for an investigation into an allegation where 500 rounds of uh, ammunition is alleged to be missing from the police custody. I have in my hand a document which was served to your office earlier today, the legal department of your office. I imagine by now you would have been informed. It is an affidavit pursuant to an impending um, matter, the court for contempt proceedings against the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, where it is alleged that ammunition, weapons, and so on were seized in certain circumstances, and the TTPS, according to this document, and the exhibits and so on are attached, the TTPS uh, um, signed off on what was taken and so on. After judgment, they were asked to return the ammunition and the firearms and so on, and they could not return 500 uh, rounds of uh, MM ammunition was missing or not returned, so to speak. They have been asked to return this, and they have not until this moment, and proceedings are on the way. 
Uh, you had asked for an investigation into that matter. Could I ask now, uh, has that in, in investigation been completed? Have you seen the findings? Where are we with that, given that it exposes now the Trinidad Tobago Police Service and Madam Commissioner, your office, to apparent uh, contempt proceedings? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I have <clears throat> not yet been brought. You have not seen the document yet? No, sure. I haven't. But I, I can serve to, you here. Ma Madam, uh, but I, you, you, you haven't seen the document. If it's a matter before the court, maybe before you proceed any further. Haven't seen the document is a it's an acceptable answer. But my, Mr. Chairman, with yes, great respect, the Commissioner of Police can indicate the status of an investigation, which is in the public domain. Madam, if it's before it's always good not to be your own counsel. Uh, madam, if Mr. the matter Chairman, if the matter is before the courts, have you seen the document, madam? No, I have no, not. No, but Mr. Okay. Chairman, you are not the attorney of the Commissioner of Police. I'm, I certainly am not. And the Commissioner is competent enough to determine if a matter is before the court and how she would propose to answer it and has advisors with her. If, Madam Commissioner, have you seen the document? Member Munilal, I think you, you have well, another Well, could I, could I now Member give the Munilal, Member Munilal, don't... Could I now give the Commissioner no, the document? You, are you now a process server? The Commissioner did Madam not say you are Member making Muni a mistake Member the Muni document, Muni which I have in my hand. Are you now a process server? Just tell me, if you are, are you a process Mr. server? Mr. Chairman, why would you not allow the Commissioner of Police to answer Mad the question for which Madam, the Commissioner is prepared? Member Munilal, let me have your the next question, The Commissioner is prepared. If, if you are, do you have the brief to be the process server in this Mr. matter? For, Mr. For Chairman, do you have a brief record? to be the attorney of the no, Commissioner of Police? No, I certainly then, don't have the brief. Let's move on to your next question, Mr. 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 Chairman, I will deal with that matter later. Thank you. But could I continue with my Certainly. Uh, inquiry here? Um, Madam Commissioner, notwithstanding this important matter of the 500 rounds of ammunition, and yes, and the frightful effect of that, I would ask um, another question as it relates to the murder rate. Now, clearly, as I think Senator Lachmedial indicated earlier, we are not in a good place in terms of this matter. It is a, it is well known and I think is reasonable to believe that a great um, percentage incidents of murders are gang related and related to criminal activity vis-a-vis -vis gangs. Could I ask you, Madam Commissioner, unless the chairman decide otherwise, could I ask you, Madam Commissioner, uh, to outline any new strategies, new institutional approaches personnel, resources, and so on, to confront uh, the, the, the gangs. Uh, and what is your take on this as you now embark upon your own term of office? Actually, I would just like to inform the committee that I'm in the process of finalizing my violent crime reduction strategy. So if I may just indicate some of the issues that so one, what I'll be focusing on is precision precision policing using intelligence prevention proaction and prosecution so we'll be focusing when I say precision policing policing of the power few because we just have a few persons in the country who are responsible for the criminal activities. I'll be focusing on dismantling gangs, the seizing of firearms, eradication of drug blocks, increasing the focus on transnational organized crime, leveraging the available technology to enhance police operations, enhancing police intelligence capability, building police legitimacy, increasing visible police presence, controlling the movements of on our, our roadways and public places, increasing detection and the successful prosecution of violent offenders, increasing accountability and transparency, improving the management and supervision of police operations. We have a zero tolerance on police ill discipline and corruption. And of course, we'll be seeking to promote a positive imaging of this police service. With regards to dismantling of criminal gangs, 
we're going to conduct extensive data mining on gangs, including seizure locations, criminal modus operandi, and the profiling of members and associates. We're going to be targeting the prolific offenders, the gang members with outstanding warrants, the drug dealers, and other notorious people. I will, can I? Um, how, how soon would you, be, would you be providing the public and the committee and with a copy of that strategy that you are in the process of preparing and finalizing? Can I say within 14 days, Chair? Reasonable. You can serve it on the committee and we'll show. Ensure I will deliver a copy to Member Munilal. Please, I'll leave it at, there, <laughs> at that point and reserve the right to return. Um, Webster Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Commissioner, again, congratulations to you, you. and looking forward to great things coming from you and your team. Um, my <clears throat> question will be focused around um, arms and ammunition that would be housed at security companies and agencies that provide that type of service. What is the procedure or policy in place for the TTPS to ensure that any arms ammunition registered to a particular agency or security firm that they are indeed accounted for? Thank you very much. It is the policy of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service Commission that the police officers in the area where security companies exist that they visit and account and ensure that firearms and ammunition are properly accounted for. In your submission to the committee, you indicated that this, um, the current system in place is under review. Um, can you indicate where you are in the review process? Um, what changes can we expect to ensure there's more efficiency and to ensure that um, more accountability exists, and also how many visits would have been done using the existing system within the last year? Unfortunately, there were not um, many visits over the last year. So that actually a breakdown in the management and supervision. However, it is my intention to ensure that policies are adhered to, ensuring that we have proper supervision at the station levels. So in terms of the revised system, how far are you in terms of the changes in upgrading? I will say probably about halfway through. Halfway through. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. My other question to you. Um, Based on your observation, not only as commissioner of police, but your years in the service, you came up through the police service, police force. Um, do you think there are any weaknesses that exist within state agencies that are likely to facilitate or contribute to the prevalence of um, firearms, especially illegal firearms in our society? What I'm trying to find out, if based on your years of experience and your observation as Commissioner of Police and then before, do you think there are any weaknesses within state, the state or state agencies that will likely facilitate a prevalence of firearms, particularly illegal firearms? I cannot, I cannot, um, I cannot say yes for sure. For, for example, are, are you happy with customs? Um, maybe Mr. Murad or somebody, uh, we, we, want, we want to know. Maybe um, we haven't heard from Officer Hazel. We, 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 we want to know. Okay. Um, in, terms of, in terms of customs and excise. And we're not singling out anyone. We're just using it as, as an example of the agencies that you have to work with. Well, I want to take this opportunity to indicate the good working relationship between the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and the other agencies. We have the customs, the immigration, the port, the prisons, the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. We have engaged in discussions which are quite fruitful 
and uh, we intend to have a very good working relationship going forward. So eventually, I think we will be able to control at some level. Yes, okay. One more question before I move to members. An observation before I move on to my other question is quite interesting because I remember having your predecessor here before the committee and a similar question being asked. And he would have indicated certain weaknesses within certain agencies that, con that is currently contributing to the issue of illegal firearms. So that's why I asked that question of you based on your years in the service coming up and now as Commissioner of Police. But moving along to my other question, um, and any one of the officers, please answer. Um, have you, of, um, Mr. Jude, to your chairman, have you observed or are you aware of collusion between criminals and agents of the state that facilitate the importation of illegal firearms into Trinidad and Tobago? If yes, have these reports been documented and investigated? Yes, ma'am. Um, the, the illegal uh, importation slash smuggling of firearms, of course it is of concern to us. And uh, we would have realized that some of our biggest hauls would have come through the, the ports and even our, our airports. Um, of course, that would suggest that uh, persons uh, perhaps associated with these agencies may be complicit somewhat you know, in, in assisting uh, lawbreakers, so we call them facilitators. And of course, our, in embarking on our investigations into that arena, because we have launched a, a probe and investigation into, into that flow of illegal firearms into this country in, the, in that magnanimous ma manner that it's, that it's appearing. And that, that investigations involve uh, our cooperations with, with those that our friends at the U.S. Embassy, the ATF, and even the FBI and the, the, the drug enforcement people. Um, we are also collaborating with, with, with persons who are in these agencies, because uh, we, we, we have to, and uh, we are doing our own analysis, our own in, collating our own intelligence to, to impact this issue. Um, we, we, what we do is hypothesis testing, so to speak. So we, we create our hypotheses and, and run the investigation along the lines of the hypotheses to, to prove or disprove what, what it is we are, we are looking at. And of course, it's a, it's a different sort of approach that we are adopting. And um, it, is, it is newly launched. So uh, perhaps uh, we, we, we expect to see some sort of results with, with it. Now, the, I think on the last occasion that I was here, I did mention that um, we had officers trained in, in recording the, the firearms that we find in a much faster and, and more determined matter, manner that it would be circulated throughout, uh, using the Interpol, circulated throughout the, the, the different regions of, of the world, I would want to say, but we, we use, of course, our US counterparts. So, so a number of officers have been recently trained so that we can input the information into the system and have a much faster turnaround of, as to tracing where the, the weapons and where they are coming from. And of course, that information would be of great significance to any investigation, because we now have a point of origin. Point of origin should lead us to, to contacts. Contacts would lead us to, to be able to pay surveillance on certain people, places, and things. I hope that has answered your question. So it is safe to say that, um, Mr. Simon, that yes, there's evidence of some collusion, and yes, the matters have been investigated. Well, ma'am, the evidence is, is anecdotal. But um, I think that um, any, any right-thinking person may want to, to suggest that something is amidst at, at different places. Okay, thank you. Mitchell? Thank you very Sorry, much. you have some more questions. Next one, you go ahead. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Commissioner, um, I just want to touch on two areas. And I can assure you, I will not ambush you with any service or affidavit. And I certainly will not be seeking the interest of any arms and ammunition dealer, whether or not they are party financiers. I want to deal with, Madam Chair, Ma Madam, Madam Commissioner, I'd like to deal with, and move away a little bit, but deal with the area of extra duty. 
Now, on the last occasion, we raised this matter in your absence because it was a matter of serious concern and there were complaints from party promoters during the carnival season. This carnival season just ended that the extra duty being charged by the police was quite exorbitant and rendered their activities a bit uncompetitive. Now, we've asked for some information for the last, well, for the three years, well, not for three years, from 2017 to 2020 on the amounts of extra duty charged and received by the police service. And we've received that information from you. The information is a bit incomplete. Most years, there are some divisions that had not reported. But if we could just use what was reported. For 2017, the police service for the carnival period, January the 1st to the Saturday following the Ash Wednesday. 2017, the police total paid one million, approximately. For 2018, approximately 2.6 million. For 2019, approximately $2.9 million was paid. And in 2020, it escalated to $3.8 million being paid by the party promoters to the police. Can you give us an understanding as to the reason for these sharp escalations over the, from 2017 to 2020? What accounted for it? I want to believe it's just the increase in demand for policing the and the increase in activities. Okay. I just did some work in that regard where I looked at the number of noise variation permits being applied for, and I also got some information from the courts with respect to the number of bar licenses and dance hall licenses and so on that you would apply for. And there is no significant increase over the course of those years. Would there be any other reason why there is this sharp increase? Because from 2017 to 2020, 2017, $1 million being received, at least, because there are there's some divisions that did not report. $1 million, all the way up to 2020, where $3.8 million was collected. And then we have the, the complaint from the party promoters that it is even more, they're being asked to put out more, they're being asked to pay more. Any other reason why? You will note in, in the submission that there was an increase in the rate, the overtime rate, over the years. So what I would like to, to highlight, if I may, the rate for police officers per hour, for a constable, $65 an hour, for a corporal, $79, for a sergeant, $96, for an inspector, $111, for the assistant superintendent, $124. The superintendent, $133. The senior superintendent, $151. And the assistant commissioner, $181 mm -hmm. per hour. Mm -hmm. And it's increased what from would, what to what? So the constable, the constable increased from $55. The corporal increased from $77. The sergeant increased from $81. The, the, that information wasn't provided to us. On, on the work. Just the, the, just the totals without that. Yeah, just, just oh, the yes. totals. What you're sorry, saying I, I apologize. That, I, like, I apologize. Like what percentage would you say? But can I, um, because I want, I want the, committee to understand even the distribution of the extra duty. Well, go ahead. Okay. So on the amount paid, 10, 
percent of the amount paid goes to the police award fund. I wanted to ask you what was that, but go ahead. It goes to PAYE award and, fund. And 5% goes to PAYE. Yeah. So that you see that even though the amount paid over the period would have been over $9 million, $10 million, the amount that went to police officers would be $8 million. The amount that went to the to tax 427,000 plus, and the amount of money going into the award fund was just over $900,000. Right, so, but I mean, as an operation of law, it would go, you have to pay your taxes, PAYE, um, and it goes into the award fund. It's, it's not so much how it was distributed, as what was charged and what was paid. But for the moment, can you tell us what is the award fund? The award fund, it's a fund that is controlled by the police of, by the Commissioner of Police, and it is used for to benefit the police service. It is catered for under the Police Service Act 1501. <coughs> so, might I give you some information on the award fund? Well, just summarize. Um, summarize. You could just tell us, you know, what it's used for. So, it is it's used for. Gratuities and awards, as the commissioner may see fit. So sometimes when you see we have, we commend officers, we would also commend and give them an award. It is used for, at the end of the year, to commend divisions and branches for their performance. The law also caters for compassionate gratuities to the spouse and children of officers, as in exceptional circumstances. Also, compassionate gratuities to any person dependent on a deceased police officer other than his spouse and children, as in exceptional circumstances, the Commissioner may allow. Does it, does it also, does it go to um, entertainment, uh, like Christmas um, parties, Christmas get-togethers, and well, carnival get-togethers? Well, not carnival get-togethers, but normally at the end of the year, the Commissioner will use his disc or her discretion and distribute to the division branches and sections. Okay, so what do you say to an accusation that the escalation between 2017 and 2020 is no other reason but the police service charging the promoters and charging persons for extra duty to pad the fund. I will not agree with that statement at all. What, what has been happening to manage and to provide proper policing services, there's a ratio that is used. And what we have done this year is completed our policy, our extra duty policy so that we can, and we did share it with the promoters, so they understood the matrix that is used in supplying police officers for functions. Yeah, um, we received that information on the last occasion, and I understand it's in, it's in draft as still, but, all right, I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. Yeah. No. Oh, Madam Commissioner, Member D, we have had, the interest from the public in this matter has now gone, the Secretariat is being bombarded. So before I give, I start the rounds of questions from members, I think it's incumbent to ask questions coming from the members of the listening public. There, in the recent past, there have been findings of TTPS and Army bullet casings on the scenes of murder and crimes. Is that a concern for the police and how is it being dealt with? A brief that has been asked and answered already. Let me move to the next question. The, um, how many coming from the members of the public again, can you tell us, can the Trinidad and Tobago police service seek outside help from the FBI, Scotland Yard, et cetera, in order to investigate cold cases and reopen them? 
the police service has already engaged with the re-employment of retired officers to manage cold cases. I believe if the senior superintendent sees it necessary to get additional assistance, we will not hesitate. We already have working relationships with the <coughs> FBI and other agencies. The next question, there have been CCT, CCTV issues, challenges, particularly in the central division. Have they been addressed? And do you intend to address them if they have not been addressed? Deputy Commissioner Simon is in the process of formalizing a CCTV operation, so I will ask him to address. Yes. Good day again, Chair. Chair, um, we have realized that um, the CCTV plays a, a very interesting and important role in, in our crime solving and, and perhaps even our solvability issues. And, uh, and, I, and I think on the last occasion, I did in fact mention that there is a project on the way between uh, the, the TTPS and Central Division, as, as you, 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 you rightfully call that division, but also in the Tunapuna district, where we are working in tandem with the, with the residents to actually allow them to, to, to get their own equipment and uh, there, there, there would be a, an internet feed coming to, to the OCs in those divisions. So for Tuna Puna, that internet feed would be going to, to Northern Division and um, in Central, we're going to, to Shagona's OC. And uh, that is a project that is underway. And when, when we see the, perhaps the fruits of it, we will be able to perhaps then extend it outside, but we, we want to take it a piece at a time and be able to, to, to actually uh, analyze the, the, the outcomes that, that, we, that we are expecting to, to arise from, from this. Um, in the interim, I am aware that um, there has been, there is an ongoing uh, arrangement and an, an ongoing project with changing of the, the, the cameras that are in use now. I was speaking up to, to the commander, the OC, only earlier on today. And they were telling me that the, the project has indeed begun and that Port of Spain is, is seeing the, 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 the fruits of it and it's being spread out through the rest of the country right now. So, so yes, Chair, we are looking at CCTV in a very crucial matter. Is the post at Enterprise being utilized to assist in the crime fighting in the Enterprise area? There's a question coming directly from Enterprise. And um, if so, how is it being utilized? Yes, Jay, um, Enterprise, uh, that's where we have uh, the task force for the Central Division North, and that is a, a very um, productive uh, functioning unit. So yes, they, they are being uh, used. Can the Commissioner of Police say if performance appraisals are being done for police officers on a regular basis, and if so, are police officers, after they have been appraised, what steps are taken to ameliorate performance and to motivate? I would like to admit that performance appraisal in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service are not done as they should be, as it should be done. However, when it, when it is done, Officers' shortcomings are taken into consideration, and we do provide required training. As gently as I can, when is that going to be rectified? Performance appraisals are by no means novel in 2023. There's a human resource department in the police service now. Ma Madam Commissioner, don't you think that that is a, a task a very low-hanging fruit that can be addressed, but very critical that can be addressed within a short space of time, and do you intend to address it? Very, mu very much so. I have already started. There's a, a committee was set up to review the whole performance appraisal in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. I would want to stop the questions from the public and come away from the phone. Member Lutch Media, I go around with one question each from the members. I start I wrong, Robin, like this. So Member Munilal, you after me, come around. Thank you, Chair. 
Mishra, I want to get back to an issue raised um, by Member Webster about collusion. And we've touched on the issue of TTPS ammunition, but there's also an issue of TTPS uniforms, oh, no, no. TTPS vehicles being reported as being seen on crime scenes or things resembling TTPS uniforms and vehicles. Um, we even have anecdotal reports of um, TTPS issued uniforms and vehicles being used to offer protection to persons who are fleeing a scene or who may be committing offenses, um, almost escorting persons from particular locations, usually near the water, to safer locations. What can you say is being done to keep a closer watch on the property of the TTPS? Do you have any plans um, to uh, change? Because I think recommendations have been made with respect to TTPS uniforms. I asked the question on the last occasion, and I don't think we received a response in writing, but are there any plans to look and modernize and um, perhaps make TTPS uniforms less um, replicable? And um, finally, um, have any persons, to your knowledge, we've read about a couple of people being involved in incidents being charged, but has any police officer, to your knowledge, in the last, let's say, five years, been convicted of being in possession of or um, not treating with properly his firearm, ammunition, uniform, or vehicle issued and put into his care? So let me answer your last question first. I am not aware of any police officer who would have been so charged. With regards to the uniform, I think we may need to reach to a point where we have um, prohibition in the importation and wearing of police uniform, just as we have in the case of the army camouflage. In terms of changing the uniform, we are not averse to changing, as in having material that is more amenable to the climate. That is something we will be, be looking into. And, and the main question about what strategies you have to keep a closer watch on the property of the TTPS, including blue lights, vehicles, uniforms, and, well, you, met, you, you addressed ammunition already, so okay. those three specifically. In terms of uniform, we will seek to ensure we have, we comply with our departmental orders and our standing orders, where station commanders are, are required to have kit inspection. This way, each officer must account on a regular basis for all uniform supplied. That system in place, why hasn't it been structured and kept and being implemented? Because it is a, it is a cause for concern. Chair, it is really just a breakdown in general supervision. Which, which you intend, which of course, to, to pull up. Yes. Member Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, I just wanted to follow up on a question that was uh, started by Member Munilal. Uh, I remember Lachmidial regarding the issues uh, related to police officers and the uh, illegal activity of, or, or, or not, depending on the outcome of the investigations, regarding the shells that were supposed to be reported to the police service, uniforms, I think in one instance, uh, someone or people uh, donned in police uniform stop people in Barataria uh, posing as legitimate police officers. So the question is two part. One, what is being done? What is your approach to deal with one of the biggest bugbears facing the police service over many years, eroding public trust and confidence regarding officers uh, suspected or alleged to be involved in corrupt activities, tipping off gangs? For and undermining the work of the police service. Uh, because one of the areas you identified earlier on in your 
strategic approach is dismantling gangs, data mining, but many of your predecessors for many years uh, have indicated that one of the challenges faced, uh, even though we have anti-gang legislation and we don't have a really strong record of dealing with gangs, is the issue of turning intelligence into evidence to apprehend gang members, bring them to justice, and also dismantle gangs. Added to that now, the component of transnational gang activity in the country. So the question is, what is your approach that is going to bear different results, given the assertions by many before of the strong linkage between gang activity and criminality in Trinidad and Tobago? We will have a more sustained approach to gang invest investigations. And because Mr. Simon has really engaged in the gang investigations from his portfolio, I will ask him to address this question. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, we we are, in fact, concerned, and perhaps my, my responses may tend to sound, sound a bit rhetoric now, but we are concerned about our gang situation. And we have, what we have realized, yes, we have the gang, the gang act, um, but we, the structure in our TTPS was that uh, we had just our, our SIU really doing the investigations or the, collecting the, the intel with re, re, re gangs. And that obviously has proven uh, insufficient to, to achieve the objectives that we would like to achieve. That is, of course, making Trinidad and Tobago a, a secure and a safe place. So we have extended our gang units, our, yes, gang, yes, our ability then to, to collate and, and re receive this intel by incorporating functioning gang units with, with very similar capabilities of the SIU, the Special Investigating Unit. And so now you, you, you find that um, we are setting up digital platforms for this sort of connectivity to be reached between the, the gang unit, the divisional gang units, and our main SIU unit, which is really under the, the auspices of the, the, the CIB, the Criminal Investigations Bureau. Uh, we, we expect that the, the officers, and it is an ongoing exercise right now, we expect that the officers selected when properly trained and so on, would be able to, to deal uh, in a much more decisive way with gangs in, in their districts, in their divisions, and the, the information is expected to, to flow seamlessly because, of course, it's, it would be digital now where, where we are having a platform for, for the officers to operate on along so that the, the flow of the inv inf information and the the, the, the unison that we expect to have between, let's say, Western Division and Southern Division, there would be a much uh, faster flow of inf information and allowing, allowing us to, to really stymie what, are, what the gangs are doing and the, 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 the crime that, that, that set seems to come out if from, from could, those sort of collaborations. If I could provide a bit of a challenge. Pardon, sir? With, if I could provide a bit of a challenge without wanting to anyway contribute to continue disillusionment, disillusionment on, the, on behalf of the public. Yes. The public hearing this, and I, with the greatest of respect, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate because Commissioner uh, Christopher is new, and, but you've all been in the service for a while, and all been part of the strategies for a number of years, decades. Would that not be correct? So now the public is being asked to say, well, we are taking a different direction, and we're digitizing and we're using real-time information, while the last 10, 15, 20 years of chain strategies, great plans have not been successful. So anyone looking on, and again, I really don't want to come across like I'm pessimistic or seeking to make the public less confident in your, in your ability, but you, you realize how much the public has heard these types of interventions about new strategies and new approaches while the crime continues to escalate unabated. So that's, 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 the, that's the scenario we face. The less successful you are moving forward, the less confidence people will have in these proposed new strategies, Commissioner.
questions? No, no, um, no chair, I prefer <laughs> not the, coming. Well, I just have part two of the question, if I could chair, regarding, related to bringing officers more successfully who are alleged to be involved or complicit with criminals to book, which has been slow in coming, which also contributes to a, a deficiency or a diminished public confidence and trust. We've not also been very successful with that is concerned. And you would, if you recall, I did indicate that we have a zero tolerance to police corruption and ill discipline. So going forward, my intention is to properly resource the Professional Standards Bureau to ensure that we have proper investigations done for officers who we are of the opinion are involved in corrupt activities. That you had already, there was already data provided, but at present, what are, what are the updated figures? as to the existence, how many estimated gangs are now existing in Trinidad and Tobago, and what are the overall numbers of the members of those gangs? Updated. Might I ask Mr. Simon to address that question? Yes. Yes. Simple question, how, how many gangs? Members. Short answer. And, and funny, funny enough, um, it's, it's a number that I am having some, some issues with because it, the variation seems to be, be, be changing, I guess. And because, because of the, when we operationalize what the law says and what the law determines a gang to be, you're getting numbers to be changed. So a gang would be two or more persons getting together. And, you understand? So that tends to, to hamper us, what we... So our last figure is 104 gangs. Yes. And I can't remember the... The, the actual numbers of persons who, who are involved in terms of the number I can't recall. We would want that in writing for this committee, yes. please. Sure thing. Um, Member Munilal. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I have just two, two questions. questions. One I consider to be fundamental and one very operational. Um, the, the first issue is that I just want to get your position as a policy issue because you are talking from the beginning, you have been raising this issue of your concern with confidence building in the TTPS, and I'm, I'm putting it under that. Is it the policy of the TTPS for officers of the TTPS to take instructions, directions, or orders from civilians in the conduct of a police investigation? Instructions. Orders, directions from, from civilian? civilians. No, that is not that is not our Madam, policy. I have in my possession a letter which I dare not show you, um, but I, I will make available to the press because it's a matter of public record, in which a committee was established of civilians to investigate the registry and the firearms division of the TTPS, and it seems to me that that has some implications for the independence of the TTPS, either reporting to or taking direction or orders oh. from, civ some, from civilians, which as you rightly indicated, is a no-no is a in terms of the um, business. So I wanted to get your view on that, whether or not the TTPS at this time is involved with any group of civilians in the conduct of any investigation into the firearm registry. Mr. Hazel, you seem interested in answering that question. And Mr. Chairman, you determine again who no, will answer I, this question. Said, Madam Commissioner, if you want to, I just saw the interaction and I I'm looking at the time. The I would just like to, refer, um, to mention to the Honorable Member that the DPP is in fact considered a civilian and therefore in, in, the, in the context of thing, Ms. He has a responsibility Mr. in which we can. Um, Mr. Mr. Hazel, you are advice. aware that the DPP is a constitutional office. Are you not aware? Yes, he is. And you but are aware he's of the power of the civilian. DPP under the Constitution that you would you would raise the, the DPP with a group of civilians is to me, a, well, mind alarming. 
Mr. Hazel, is it not the DPP a creature of the Constitution Mabemuni, Mabemuni for the specific role of working with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service? He is not a police officer. Mr. Hazel, Mr. Hazel, Mr. Hazel, the questions that I read to the chair. Mr. Hazel, I want to leave that issue there Thank and to leave your DPP reference right there. Your, I'm, I'm very scared of going further with that. Hold on, Hold on. This man is going to be the committee that you know of. Tell us what is your answer. Answer. Let him answer the question. Answer the question. So I have made my point. Put your mic on and answer the question briefly. So I am. I've made my point in terms of the police service having to interact with um, other persons for which um, professional advice have been given. We do have civilization is part of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And clearly we have had situations where we have social workers, we have counselors, we have psychologists, all of which are part of advisors from time to time and take professional steps in which we have to abide with. And clearly, so in my humble view, I feel I would say clearly that they are part, they are persons who are what I will call sworn and unsworn personnel who can be considered civilians. Just one matter, because the issue of the DPP, which I'm very familiar with, um, was raised. Of the persons who, through you, Mr. Chair, of the persons that you have mentioned, psychologists, DPP, and all of them, do any of those persons have investigative power? And I trust that you understand the difference between advisory power and investigative power. Investigative power, I mean to, um, uh, uh, conduct, an to, to conduct an interview with someone, to caution someone who is suspected of committing an offense, to have access to the books and records of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Do any of the persons you refer to, that, those, that large group of civilians with whom you consult, do they have those types of powers, the psychologists, the DPP, and all of them, or are they merely advisory in nature and can advise the TTPS, apart from the constitutionally protected DPP, of course, who has the authority to instruct the police to, in, um, to lay criminal charges. You have, men you, have mentioned on social you have mentioned the word interview, and certainly social workers have the responsibility and psychologists to interview persons. Mr. Hazel, I'm talking about a police interview with someone who is suspected of committing a criminal offense, an interview that can be used as evidence before a court. Let's not descend to the, you know, to that level. You understand my question as a part of an investigation, a police investigation into potential wrongdoing. Does a civilian get involved and conduct an, in, let's call it an interview under caution. Okay, 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 okay member. Hold on, hold on. Answer the question very discreetly and let us move on. We don't want to descend into a cross-examination session or a speech. Calm down. Go ahead, sir. Very discreetly answer the question, and then member. Yes? Okay. With regards to this particular question, the police service do not take instructions from civilians, as you would call it. Investigations and I may probably, um, you spoke about audit, persons, civilians being in an audit, and that is exactly what they are doing. An audit is not an investigation. Could I, uh, I just had my second question. Well, you, I thought you ceded your second question. No, that was the first issue. Um, uh, Member Mooney, Madam, you have one more. Go uh, ahead. It's an oper basic operational question, really. Uh, uh, we had raised the issue of the CCTV cameras, and every time we meet, we like just getting an update, Mr. Simon, who had been talking about it before. Mr. Simon, would you have any nice new information on the uh, operationalization of the CCTV cameras in terms of how many may be operational now, how may, many may be done at this time. And could I state, just for the record, because we have been talking about the scanners all evening, the, the scanners, while they were leased to the TTPS, is still the property of the Trinidad and Tobago people, the government. They were purchased by TSTT and leased to the 
HTTPS. So in the event that those can are removed. Ask the question. Yes, um, the gentleman is looking for, is looking for the you answer. You asked the question. And I asked uh, the level of operationalization of the CCTV cameras. Yes. But while he was looking, I was making the point about you, the scanners. You, I know. Go on. Yep. Thank you very much, member. Um, the amount of cameras that we that are actually being monitored right now, it's 1,312. However, this is a number that comes out of a potential 1,796. So in fact, there are 484 cameras, and that this is throughout the country, yes, yes. trying to be good. So there are 484 cameras that, are, that you are getting some issues with. However, there, there is a, a new plan where, where those cameras are being removed and we are in, we are, the installation of new cameras is being done. And it has started and Port of Spain and other, other places are in fact experiencing the changes. Thank you. Thank you. Webster Roy, you have a question coming around the bend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, through you, um, sometimes I would get information about children being used as mules by gangs to transport ammunition, firearms, etc. I wonder if as part of your strategy, if you have any intervention specifically geared towards those vulnerable children, do you plan to increase the num number of police youth clubs? Do you plan on resourcing police youth clubs more so that we could have that intervention in our communities to prevent children being used by criminal elements? Yes, indeed. Right now we have operating 97 police youth clubs. We intend to expand that and also to ensure that we resource all existing youth clubs. to 3.8 million in 2020. Um, if you could just give a breakdown, you indicated that there was an increase in activities, well, number of events, as well as an increase in salary payments or in extra duty allowance. Uh, if you could just give us that in a breakdown, explaining how it went from 1 million to 3.8. Um, the other question is to Mr. Simon. You indicated, you, well, you said the word variance, and from our recollection, there is a variance in the amount of criminal gangs um, told to this committee on a previous occasion and the number that you just um, raised. What is the source of your information? Is it the SSA or is it uh, just your intelligence within the police service and using the um, anti-gang legislation as a guide? My, my intelligence uh, and using the anti-gang position as the guide. And do you know whether that intelligence aligns with the intelligence of the SSA? No, I, I can't say. However, um, that, that, that those are issues that we are really working on and clearing up. And in fact, what we have um, embarked upon is something called a, a gang comstat, and that would in, include and involve a number of high hierarchy in terms of the in terms of the our intelligence network in Tran Tobago, and it, it it involves uh, TTDF, Customs and Excise, Immigration, SSA, the, the TTPS, and and some other agencies who actually involve in who actually involve in, in intelligence gathering, mm -hmm. and it's because we want to be able to, to to come to some sort of agreement as to to where we are and how we are to proceed and. Uh, I, I did write up the, the agenda this week, and I, the first question on my agenda was, gangs, where are we now? So it, it will include how many do we actually have, how are we actually determining, and, and where are we, what are the, the, the credentials really, what we are we gonna use to say this is a gang as opposed to this is a joint venture exercise, yes? Yeah, all right, um, and the last question to Commissioner. Um, you have indicated that the TTPS was at the time 
developing a policy to guide the issuance of FULs. Can you give us a status update with respect to that policy document? I'm sorry, Commissioner, on, on, a, last, on a previous occasion, um, the TTPS indicated to this committee, um, actually in a submission dated October 25th, 2022, so it was before your time, um, that a policy document was being developed um, to guide the process for the issuance of FULs so as to ensure compliance at all times with the law. So we just want a status update. Has this document been completed and has um, the policy been put into effect? The policy document has not been completed. It has been reviewed in its financial final stages. However, for the guidance of the FIAM issue, there's a stringent investigative process that is now being conducted. When you, when you, when you, okay, first question is, when do you expect the policy document to be completed and the policy put into effect? That's the first question. And the second question is, um, when you say there's a stringent process in place, are you saying that there was not a stringent process before? Not that there wasn't a stringent process before, but the investigations for applications now is in the domain of one specific section. Prior, the investigation was done throughout the country. Throughout the? Throughout the 10 divisions. Right, so the, the sergeant would visit and make inquiries of your neighbors, of your spouse, et cetera. Yes. Now it's being um, done centrally in one Yes. Unit. Okay, and, and when do you expect the, the policy to be completed and put into effect? By the end of the first quarter, 2023, so by the end of March. Thank you. Member Richards. Thank you, Chair, through you. Uh, my final question to Commission and your team. We focused a lot on the uh, ammunition and in some instances arms coming that should be reported to the TTPS and law enforcement, legitimate law enforcement, uh, ending up in the hands of criminals and on crime scenes. In the submission made dated October 25th, 2022, it was stated, quote, heads of divisions of the TTPS are required to make visits to security companies and agencies with approved cache of firearms and ammunition to ensure that their records are maintained in accordance with the laws of Trinidad Tobago. Is there a concern by the TCPS, or has there been evidence that, in addition to ammunition and possibly arms in the TCPS ending up on crime scenes, that we also have an issue with private security companies who may not be as, as regulated as we want in, in our present environment and are not supervised or, or by the TTPS in, in that broad term of supervision based on the fact that you're supposed to be visiting them regularly to ensure that they are above board. Is that a concern for the TTPS? It is a concern, but I must indicate that there is no evidence to suggest that the private companies are not following procedures. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a matter that comes up from time to time. Back in 2020, um, it was then stated by the Commissioner of Police who flagged a correlation between state contracts and gang activity and the prevalence of gang activities. I believe a statement was made specifically with respect to contracts at the level of local government. Um, one, do you agree with this issue? And secondly, are you taking any steps to address this issue or do you still see it as a matter that requires urgent attention by the TTPS, and are there any ongoing investigations into state contracts linked to gang activity? I am unaware of any investigations at this time. Issue arose yet. I just want to raise this issue to get your feelings and your observations on policy and implementation. What has been the experience uh, so far 
with the use of um, pepper spray tasers in terms of uh, being used to deter uh, criminal activity or used by police officers in the conduct of their own duty. And related to that, is there any policy by the TTPS on the use of tear gas? Thank you, member. The use of tasers and pepper spray is regulated by our, pol our policy, our use of force policy. Pepper spray and tasers have been procured and distributed throughout the 10 divisions. With regards to tear gas, tear gas may be used by our public order team in the execution of their duty. Webster Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Commissioner, earlier I asked you a question about accountability in terms of those agencies, security agencies and companies that may house um, ammunition and firearms, right? Mm -hmm. What I want for, for, from you is to submit in writing for me um, how many companies are uh, approved, the name of the company or agency, the division that they would fall under, and the date of the most recent visit. And also to submit in writing a timeline for your update in terms of the system of um, reviewing the agency's essential accountability. Thank you. Madam, um, <clears throat> Madam Commissioner, in your New Year's greeting of 2023, you indicated that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has made significant strides in building public trust and confidence through community initiatives and partnerships. As part of our mandate, this committee, we are to ensure and authorize to examine, amongst other things, the security and the protection of citizens. First question, tell us, what are some of these key initiatives and partnerships that you spoke about? Give us concrete. Please, I would like to take this. Tell question. us, concrete. Thank you very much. Uh, we started off in terms of for the Within the Christmas season, we, our, our focus chair would be working in partnership, as you rightly said, community stakeholder partnership is part of the strategic direction of the TTPS. And with that, we have been yielding success. We started quite recently with meeting with stakeholders um, throughout Trinidad and Tobago. In particularly, we have just concluded um, Christmas into Carnival, where we engage over 35 stakeholders in working with us in our program operations there. Um, we have moved on successfully from that into the Carnival arena, which of course it is public knowledge now that our Carnival, which was dubbed the mother of all Carnival, has been a tremendous success. And part of the initiative of its success had to do with the whole issue as it relates to our stakeholder partnership, which to my mind we have approved. Um, we have been, in terms of the relationship that we have garnered with our stakeholders in staging this um, initiative. These meetings of engagement has all brought on board the partnership approach, which we would have developed in terms from the ministries, various ministries of government and private sector of life, which have seen successfully brought on board um, and just managing just by way of an example, um, seen over 37,000 persons tourists and visitors alike leaving their destination from Trinidad and Tobago safe by way of 13 tourist calls that have made to this beautiful island thus far, and they are able to return to their country hailing to Trinidad and Tobago as a safe place. Um, we have also just concluded in the carnival arena as well, where just over 37 34,000 um, tourists 
would have visited our shore, and uh, we have had the lowest record of serious crimes reported in um, as, as related of carnival crime incident on any citizen or tourists in that like. This is the partnership that we are talking about that is yielding success under the stewardship of our commission of police who is guiding the process in ensuring that we are not only diligent, but we are operating in a strategic direction that is focused and intelligence-led. I have a brief question. Uh, yes, yes, of course, of course. Um, uh, Madam Commissioner, a, a, another new issue to put on the table, just for your comment, uh, and brief comment, really. This matter, this troubling matter as well, of um, school violence, while clearly it is not a school violence, there are many, many reasons and you know, we, we understand it's a multifaceted problem. It's not a problem only of law enforcement or policing. It's multifaceted. But um, the, the TTPS over the years uh, has made certain initiatives and programs and so on to intervene, to work with the education system to curb school violence. So I'd like you to just comment on what is ongoing in terms of that type of initiative. And you, you made reference earlier to the use of force policy. Is it possible that members could have a copy of the use of force policy uh, so we could also you know, um, educate ourselves on what is the use of force policy for taser, t um, pepper spray, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. Yes, and I believe the member realized he has not heard Mr. Maharaj's voice for the afternoon. <laughs> so I will, <laughs> my team, to yes, so, so my team is well prepared. So Mr. Maharaj, Assistant Commissioner, will address that question. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, member, for the question. Um, school violence. Um, the Trent Tobago Police Service has adopted the role of facilitator, of parent, of teacher, of all the failures of society in socializing children, and the end result is violence. We have a number of programs that we have put in place through our gender-based violence unit, child protection unit, where lectures are conducted, seminars, workshops, not only with the children, but with the parents, most of whom are single parents. So therein lies the conundrum and the contributor to the violence in school. The socialization process has failed. The institutions with responsibility for socializing the child, the church, the temple, the mosque, the mandir, the police has embraced the role of the failures of those institutions through our programs so that we can chart a course and develop or reinstate some of the traditional values of respect and mannerisms that are required to develop a young, impressionable school child. See Member Webster Roy nodding. Member Richards, you have just, a... Just quickly, based on something Member Munila asked last time, and it's related to the... Uh, question Member Mitchell asked and the document you, you provided regarding uh, the cost of engaging police for uh, events and a suggestion that uh, sometimes NGOs and non-profit organizations are also charged and the, the police service needs to understand that these are not-for-profit non events and some sort of consideration should be given to them regarding the events where police protection is provided without a charge being attached to it. So just a suggestion to look into the policy to see that is something that uh, is uh, instituted so that not everyone gets painted with the same brush, particularly for school bazaars, etc., which I understand in some cases are uh, instructed to take police to at a take, cost. To take a huh? strength. And that's, just, yeah, and that's just a suggestion because these are not, not for, for profit events and, and fundraisers, etc. Would you take a look at that and revert? Because it's, it's an important issue, because even when the community, it helps build 
community relationship, when the police can be amongst the people in the community and without a charge. That is something, so it's not always about the extra strength and duty, but sometimes that relationship is priceless. Member Lachmina, sure. if you can ask, there's a question. Ask the question. You, Sir, you, I, yes. I yes. I just you, have one comment to make, and I, and I want to put it on the, on the record. Um, my commendation and congratulations to the police service for a safe carnival, and to you, Mr. Hazel. Uh, but in particular, what you spoke about in terms of the stakeholder engagement um, led by the police service and, of course, as participants in that stakeholder process in planning a number of different and very new and novel events taking place during the carnival, I want to put it on the record, my commendation to you all. Thank you. This is your time, madam, to speak to the country, to build confidence so that there are no, for the pessimists, for all those who are the doubters. What do you have, what plans do you have in place that would give the country, the citizens, a sense of security and safety and feel that the police service is concerned about the reduction of crime and criminal activity and the protection of the citizenry. Tell us. Chair, I want to assure the national community that the police service under my leadership will seek to provide professional policing services I will be seeking to ensure that the police service is capable of addressing all the challenges that we face, the current challenges, to ensure that my, the officers have the capacity and the capability of achieving all our mandates, to ensure that we are responding, that I lead an agile organization that is effective and, again, professional. I am grateful. I am sure that you have the support of all your associates in this endeavor. You can assure the, the nation that you have the support? Yes, I, thankfully, I can assure that I have the support, and additionally, I appreciate the support of the entire citizenry to achieve this. Again, I would like to advise and inform that it is not just the TTPS. We cannot do it alone, and we need the support of every single citizen. Madam Commissioner, we are indeed grateful for your attendance and your presence this afternoon with us. We want to thank you on behalf of the entire committee, um, this joint select committee on national security, we want to thank you for your one, taking time off to come before us, two, giving us some assurances of your plans for the country, but three, we would want to see some robust policing in these very challenging times, of course robust within the four corners of the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, but on behalf of the entire committee and by extension the citizenry of Trinidad and Tobago, we want to thank you and your team for coming before us this afternoon. I think, Madam Secretary, we can consider that this meeting, the public part of this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you kindly. You're most welcome, Chair.